everybody. Welcome to Building My Legacy podcast. Today I have with me J.C. Granger. He is the founder of Infinity Marketing Group. He does digital marketing and does a lot of work with lead generation. And those of us who struggle with lead generation love the types of J.C. So I am eager to hear what you have to teach us and share with us about lead generation and how you work with companies. So it's all yours, JC. Oh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I'll, I guess I'll give you a quick overview. Um, you know, I, I've been doing digital marketing about 20 years now. It's, it's probably only existed a little longer than that, if that ages me at all. But um, I've owned my agency for nine years and, you know, we didn't really have a, a, a solid direction. You know, it's kind of the accidental agency. Uh, which is very common in agency. You know, you start with one thing and, and the people keep asking for more stuff. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you have an office and employees and, and a bunch of clients. You're like, oh, wow, we're an agency now. Um, you know, so, you know, we, we concentrate on everything. You know, we're a full service agency that, that mostly, mostly specializes in the B2B uh, tech industry. Um, about 20% of our client base is completely random, which I kind of do that on purpose to keep it, you know, quote, spicy, so to speak, you know, just so we can kind of have a little bit, you know, mix things up a little bit, but 80% of our, of our client base is B2B tech. Um, we started getting really massively into the more lead gen specific more recently. I mean, lead gen has always been something we've done, but obviously when you're a full service agency, there's a lot of value there that you offer a client, you know, there's branding, there's, there's a long-term infrastructure setups, you know, with websites and funnels and all those things that are valuable in, in, in the short, medium and long term, But with the onset of COVID, what's happened is so many companies are struggling that although they do understand the value of long term, it's not exactly something that's on their mind right now. Their mind is on the short term. How do we survive right now? Right. How do we thrive and maybe gobble up some market share um, at, during these hard times? And so it's very, um, it's it's very focused on the near term. So we've really pivoted more towards concentrating on our more immediate lead gen uh, capabilities uh, for all types of companies, but, you know, again, sp specifically in the, in the tech industry. What advice do you give to companies for, in order to help them maximize their digital marketing? Well, there's the advice I would have given them before COVID and there's the advice I give okay. them now. So, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, do, I'll answer both only because, you know, we're not going to be in this forever. So I think it's important that, you know, some people might be listening to this after we've come out of the trenches, so to speak. Um, to maximize your digital marketing when you don't have a worldwide pandemic going on, um, you really need to focus on the infrastructure. Um, so many marketing plans that I've seen are just a big house of cards. You know, they, they look tall and they look big, but the, they're very, there's so many holes in the middle. Um, and it's a very shaky foundation. So for example, you might get a company that has a great looking website and they have a, they're doing a ton of advertising. The problem is, for example, that their tracking codes on their form fills um, are either not present at all or they're broken. And what that means is that, yes, you're sending a lot of advertising and you're paying for a lot of money for clicks and it's coming to your website. And listen, you're probably still making money. People are filling out the form. Your salespeople are talking to them. You're doing fine. No, no, I'm not challenging that your marketing is working. What I'm challenging is that most people's marketing is not efficient or optimized. So on the flip side, if you had your, your, your tracking codes down, if you really spent the time to build out an infrastructure on your website and have you know, upsells and downsells if you're B2C on e-commerce, or if you took the time on B2B to have um, drip series campaigns for demos if you're a software company, or for you know uh, phone calls if you're you know doing IT services for example, people sometimes don't take that extra mile. So what happens is, let's say you're spending ten grand a month on your on your paid ads to your website, and you're getting form fills. Well, if you don't know which ads are producing the most uh, uh, lead gen, then yes, you're making money. Maybe you're spending ten grand a month and you're making forty grand. So you're saying, hey, we're doing great. We're making thirty grand a month net on ads. But then someone like me goes in there, audits the whole system and realizes there's no way to really track which ads are working the best necessarily. So we do a reverse analysis, go in there and say that 80% of all of your money is coming from 15% of your ads, which means you're literally blowing 85% of your budget and you don't even know it. Imagine how much, if you were making 40 grand on 10 
and then I restructure it to focus on, you know, 85% of your budget into the 15% that was working the best, you know, you could have a three, four times that, you know, using the exact same budget, not changing anything else. It's like just simply adding these tracking codes properly. And I give that just as one example. There's a million examples. You know, there's a going in and auditing email drip campaign series and looking at the subject lines. I have a video that I put out um, about a year ago about how to double the size of your business, of your revenue, um, just by changing your subject line. Because, and that's an infrastructure piece if you think about it, because a lot of people, they go, look, our emails are working. We have a, a 20% open rate. Uh, we have a, a 3% click-through rate and we're making X and they're just happy. Right. But I go and I look at these subject lines and I say, well, if we changed it to this, so I start split testing subject lines. All of a sudden now you've got a 40% open rate. And here's the thing about email, for example. Let's say you send out an email and you make uh, $1,000, All right? I'm just completely random sure. <laughs> round number. Yeah. Let's say you sent out an email and it resulted in $1,000 worth of sales. Maybe you're an e-commerce store or something like that. Okay. If, if you change nothing else except for the subject line and the subject line that you change it to gets twice the open rate, what are your numbers now? Now you're making $2,000. And all you did, because remember, if nothing else changes, then, then the numbers are going to stay, the conversion rates are going to stay the same, right. right? So if your open rate doubles, then everything else will double because, well, in theory, anyway, there are exceptions. You can't do like bait click style subject lines. Okay. I'm not talking about the lie to them and, and, you know, force them in to believing something from the subject line. That's not the reality of the, of the ad cop or the, of the email copy. Right. Um, I, what I'm saying is if you actually are, you know, intelligent, intuitive about it, and you actually just come up with a legitimately better subject line <laughs> that is okay. more intriguing and still relevant, then you've just doubled your sales literally by changing a few words in one part of one email. Now imagine doing that across all the emails in all your different drip series campaigns. So again, circling back, the point is, is that my answer for people, for companies, when you're not in a big pandemic is look at your infrastructure. The details matter, right? Because these little changes can result in massive differences in ROI. Now my answer for pandemic, how to optimize your, your digital marketing, um, focus on the near term. <clears throat> as much as it makes me cringe to say that because I'm such a long-term thinker when it comes to marketing, um, it, you know, you got to survive. You have to do what you got to do, you know, when you got to do it. And right now we're in a situation where if you, you know, if you're working at, like, here's the thing, and, and, you know, we offer SEO cause you know, we're full service, but we are not concentrating on selling SEO. SEO takes months and months and months to gain traction. If you have a budget that you're spending on SEO and you're not in a, <clears throat> let's say, um, an industry where you can't run ads, like if you're in CBD or marijuana sales um, or even some sort of sometimes financial or legal, um, there's restrictions and you can't run certain paid ads. So you rely on SEO um, and social media and things like that, in which case, okay, keep doing that. But even then, I would say if, if you're not allowed to do paid ads or you're very restricted, then I would say turn your SEO budget into an email marketing budget. Go buy a list, clean it first, go through some third-party cold outbound uh, softwares. Um, there's one that I like called a mail click convert. Um, so, you know, I don't ever recommend buying a list and importing it directly into your whitelisted system. You know, you don't, you don't buy a list. Even if you clean it, you still don't want to put it into your MailChimp or your HubSpot or your Marketo. Um, you'll get, you could get blacklisted across all different platforms because they share their blacklist to prevent people from oh, hopping. Okay. So if you're, if you are relying on SEO for a lot of your business, um, then I'd say start moving that budget over to email because email can have a very direct, very immediate impact, right? You, you, you get a bigger list, you clean it up, you warm it up, then you import it. And then you've got, cause you know, you send out an email right now, you start getting replies pretty much right away. People click through pretty much right away. Um, if you are someone who can do paid ads, for example, <clears throat> um, paid ad budgets, those are quick returns, right? You, you launch the campaign, ads start showing up, people start clicking. Um, so you can move, uh, it, you know, anyway, the, the point is, is that there are certain things that you really want to focus on. If you're B2B, go all in on LinkedIn right now, right? Um, and do one-to-ones, you know, do outreaches to these individual people. You, if you have a sales navigator account on LinkedIn, you can laser target your demographic. You can target right. job titles, industries, locations, company size, um, you know, you name it. And so it would be really good if you're B2B to be focusing on those one-on-one -on -one outreaches, you know, and there's companies like, you know, we offer a service that, that, that takes that on at scale. 
and it's a done for you service. Um, you can do it on your own if you have the, the resources and the time as well. But I really, I really encourage people to focusing on things that have more of immediate results right now, like paid ads, direct outreach, uh, and email marketing. So JC, I think one of the biggest struggles that I have and I think other people have is how do you keep from being overwhelmed by all of this? I mean, I, I do know Sales Navigator. I use it. I use it a lot. And then, but you're right. There's a process that goes with it. And it is easy to become overwhelmed or you get busy with something else and you go, oh my goodness, when was the last time I did? And you, right? And you run and go check your Sales Navigator and you go, okay, I'm behind. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, there's, there's softwares out there uh, that will allow you to um, uh, automate some processes. Um, I'd be very careful if, because you can automate a campaign right into the ground just as much as you can automate it into success. The automation tools that are out there, and there's a million. I mean, I, I don't need to name any because literally if you just Google LinkedIn automation software, they'll have about a million results. And they're all pretty good. A couple of notes though, don't, don't choose any software that is uh, plug-in based. LinkedIn doesn't really like that when you start actually plugging right into the browser itself. I'd recommend a software that uses a cloud-based technology where it's really just running the browsers in the background and you don't see it. Um, but don't download any Chrome extensions to do it. Um, they, they don't like that and they might shut down your account. So that's just a okay. word to the wise. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, it's about strategy though. You know, you really want to make sure that if you're doing LinkedIn strategy, if you know, outreach, that you don't come off super salesy like right away. You know, um, so, but to answer your question about not being overwhelmed, um, again, those automation tools can really help take a lot of that, you know, uh, load off of your shoulders. Um, you don't want to overdo it. You definitely, you know, talk to someone who knows what they're talking about when it comes to LinkedIn automation, um, like a company like ours or another company that you find online that deals with that. Um, you could even Google some best practices based on that. For example, there's a certain amount of invites per day that you can do safely and, and, and there's, and it's totally fine. And there's a certain amount that'll get your account banned, right? <laughs> Cause they just don't, they know they don't want, they don't want spammers. They're fine with networkers, right? LinkedIn loves networkers. They just hate spammers. So there's a healthy difference between the two. Um, you know, other things you can do to, um, <clears throat> keep from being overwhelmed. Um, I think is really just, uh, something I mean, you were talking about offline, which was uh, partnerships, right? You know, maybe find, uh, someone else who has a business that is, that is complementary to yours, but not competitive, right? Um, where you guys might be able to exchange either uh, email lists or uh, exchange, um, you know, shout outs if you're, if you do big sh social media. So in the influencer marketing uh, arena, the big influencers will sometimes partner with each other and promote each other because they have a similar type of following, right. but they don't have each other's following necessarily. So they just mutually promote each other and then they both gain from that, right? <clears throat> so you can take that story and adapt it to your industry, you know, whether it be tech or e-commerce, uh, real estate, you know, it doesn't matter, right? You know, there's always someone. So again, in real estate, you know, if you're a real estate, uh, business, you know, uh, broker and, you know, pairing up with a mortgage person, which is a very common thing that they already do, but that's right. a great example. You'll find that they, they are in this, they have the same demographic, but they are non-competitive. So try to find some strategic alliances that could help you out in the short term as well. And that should take a lot of that pressure off your shoulders if you can work well with someone else, even if just temporarily, you know, everyone's in this together right now. A lot of businesses um, are suffering. You know, we took a big hit right away too. I'll be hundred percent honest. You know, um, a lot of our smaller clients and even one bigger client, you know, they just, they just, they ran out of money. You know, they, they lost their butts too because of all this. Now we got a little lucky because we specialize in tech and a lot of the world and businesses are turning to technology right now to, right. to circumvent right. the issues we're having. So, even though we lost clients in the beginning, um, we had enough to still hold this over. And now we have a lot of proposals by request from tech companies um, to help service them. So we know we're going to be okay because we're more shifting. We're not, you know, losing, you know, we lost in the beginning, but now we've got new business coming in that makes up for it. But not every industry is that lucky. If you're in the restaurant or hospitality industry, that's really, really hard right now, you know? Um, but like I said, as far, you know, automation tools, um, really definitely anything you do that you can automate, it doesn't, whether it be LinkedIn, whether it be your report, maybe your, you know, Gusto is great for payroll. If you get stuck in payroll spreadsheets for three hours a month, 
you know, go with gusto. I mean, I, I don't work for them. I don't get a referral fee. It's just, there's some things I thought were the most amazing thing ever. Um, another software that I loved was trainual.com. It's basically automating all of your training processes so that when you hire someone new or a contractor, maybe you had to unfortunately let uh, someone go as a W-2 because they were too expensive and you couldn't afford it, but you still need that work done. So maybe you hired a contractor at less amount because they're just doing that specific work and they have other clients, but how do you train them? Right. So trainual is such a great automation thing where once you upload your training, the person just goes in, they take the training all on their own. They can do tests. It, it tells you, you know, how far along the process they are. I mean, there are certain softwares, uh, uh, SaaS companies that when I, when I use them, I think, how the hell did I ever live without these people? <laughs> you know, um, if you're someone who spends a lot of time with proposals in a Word document, go to PandaDoc, for example. And again, I'm just giving examples. You can research right. the ones that you like the most. Um, right. But anything that can automate any part, even if you just save one hour a month, it's worth it, right? So I think a lot of people to help from being overwhelmed should turn to technology and software to automate a lot of processes that they're spending their time on right now because their time is so incredibly valuable to get themselves out of this mess. And I think that they don't realize that they might be suffering a death of a thousand cuts. Right. I, I think you're absolutely right on there because what I hear from um, so many people is, okay, now we're going to go back. It's in waves. How do you manage waves, first of all? Because you may have people all over the country. What does that mean? Some are working, some aren't working, some are virtual, some, you know, that, so the questions just go on in terms of creating another level of uncertainty. So I think there's going to be continued adjustment and automation is going to be huge. Yeah. And um, people are going to have to work with less for a period of time until things get uh, strongly underground, under their feet. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. JC, who is your ideal client? Oh, mine? Um, <clears throat> We, so, I mean, if I'm doing like perfect, perfect client, I mean, yeah, we, we have perfect like, client. Generally speaking, we're, we're great with all B2B tech companies, but um, my favorite personally is um, B2B um, enterprise software yep. companies. Um, and the reason being is, I mean, I, I'm just this tech nerd from the Bay Area. You know, I grew up in like San Jose, Palo Alto, Mountain View kind of thing, you know, sitting there trying to hack AOL when I was 12, like, like one of those stories. So like software, like those are my people, right? Like Silicon Valley style, like, you know, we're headquartered in, in downtown Denver right now, but you know, I grew up in the Bay area. So um, I, I, I really geek out on, on cool software, especially if it can help like my business. I mean, someone's like, Hey, I found this new software that does X, Y, Z. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Oh, that would save me so much time. And I go in and I, just, I, I do demos and I research and I, the amount of money I spend per month on software subscriptions is criminal, but it also saves me so much time and money uh, that it's totally worth it. Right. So um, because I'm so passionate, I think about that, that particular niche uh, that nothing um, makes me happier than uh, a software company, you know, that does B2B coming to me and saying, Hey, how, how can you help us? And, and I just kind of dig in cause I, I geek out, you know, on their mm -hmm. software. And then I, it helps my creative juices flow and figure out all the different ways because I am a potential client too, right? Because I like all types of B2B software, even if it doesn't relate to me, that's, what's funny is I'll even, I've done demos for softwares. <laughs> like, like I wouldn't take any person's individual time, but like, I'll do like the online ones that are already there, like pre-recorded of, of software that has nothing to do with helping me personally, just because I find it fascinating. So yeah, I guess my ideal client is kind of like a high, small to low or mid medium um, software tech company. We're not the best fit for startups unless they're uh, post funding because you know, we're more of a, a second stage marketing agency. You come to us after you've kind of outgrown your first one um, and you need that really much bigger solution, that bigger plan um, and that long-term plan. So, uh, yeah, I'd say if you're kind of high, small to like, you know, low to mid medium sized tech companies, kind of maybe in that, you know, two to 20 million a year kind of thing, that's kind of where we really shine. Um, you know, we could take on really big companies. It's just, you know, we were talking about, I mean, you offline, like some, there's just so much red tape sometimes to like fortune 500s that I don't know that I'm the most patient person with that. <laughs> I like to be able to be, you know, lean and agile and be able to shift, you know, 
quickly to adapt to market uh, demands and new ideas. Uh, and I find that that's easier to do with the kind of small to medium size uh, software companies. They're usually a little more accepting of that idea and it benefits them more too. They can, they can make quick gains if they can move faster. So yeah, I'd, I'd say, I'd say the B2B software uh, companies are, are my, my jam. So what's interesting about you, JC, is you have this remarkable combination of being a techie geek, as you say, with psychology. So it's like two different extremes of life. Tell us a little bit about how that works together. It's an interesting marriage. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. You know, growing up in such a tech place, you would think that I would have gone into some sort of like engineering or coding, you know, uh, right. lifestyle. But I remember <clears throat> there's this old uh, movie from the 80s, um, uh, Big with Tom Hanks. You remember that one? Yes. And for anyone, I guess for anyone listening who doesn't know this movie, long story short is Tom Hanks plays this, uh, uh, this adult who used to be a kid and he plays some like carnival game and it turns him into an adult, but he still has the kid mind. Like, he's just basically a, a child trapped in a man's body who enters the, the corporate world accidentally. And there's a scene where um, he, he works with his toy company. He's in the boardroom and there's this guy with a suit on uh, up front and it's actually the dad from Home Alone, uh, same character. But um, he's, they're, they're, they're looking at this, this new toy they want to launch. It's this, it's this robot that turns into a building. Right. So think like a transformer, except instead of it turning into anything cool, it turns into a skyscraper. Like there's nothing cool about that. Right. <laughs> so, but this guy in the suit is up there saying that this toy is gonna be the greatest thing ever because look at all these charts and graphs. Right. And he's pointing with this, this little, you know, pointer. And he's like, well, look at this, the numbers say this. And Tom Hanks is sitting at the, at the table and he keeps raising his hand and he goes, I, I don't get it. And he's like, well, what don't you get? And he goes, well, it's just not, it's not fun. I don't get it. And he goes, well, did you see the numbers? And so there's this battle in this, in this scene between Tom Hanks, who's a kid in his head, basically, just looking at this for what it really is and not, not letting all these numbers and stuff cloud his judgment like this, you know, corporate adult. And I remember when I saw that scene, I remember thinking that <clears throat> I didn't ever want to be that guy in the suit who made a prediction or thought something was going to be great because look at all these charts and graphs. I wanted to be that, that kid at the table raising his hand saying, I don't get it. And what I realized about that is that, you know, if you understand how people think, like true raw human nature, you actually leave very little to chance. Um, human nature is not going to change while me and you are alive, right? Um, evolution of, of the mind takes a lot longer than that. So <clears throat> if you understand the fundamentals of how people react to things, you can adapt that to other things that do change, like technology changes, even culture changes, for example. Um, you know, um, but how we think at a base level does not. So when it came time for me to go to college, <clears throat> I actually got accepted into the engineering degree at the University of Washington, aerospace engineering, very specifically at University of Washington. But I turned it down because I, I really did want to do a psychology background. And I ended up landing at, um, in the end anyway, at University of Colorado. They have a fantastic psychology program. And what I did is I put all my work emphasis because I always wanted to do marketing. I put all my work emphasis into marketing. So that was like my first job in right. college. Yeah. So that's what I've been saying. I'm doing it for 20 years now. I started in 2000, right? I mean, digital marketing maybe started in like 98. I mean, well, I mean, you didn't have anything back then, right? You didn't have paid ads. You didn't have social media. You didn't have mm -hmm. SEO. You didn't have, you didn't have YouTube. Like, you, you know, there was no, none of that. What you, had, you had like email and like angel fire websites. <laughs> Like, you know, like there was, there was really nothing yet. You, 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 uh, you know, Yahoo had just come on the scene, you know, like it right, wasn't even, right. yeah, it was so in its infancy, but, um, so I put my work emphasis into that and I, I learned practically how to do marketing, but I got my education and how people think. And that's been really, really helpful for marketing. Cause ultimately anything you do in digital marketing is really just appealing to the thought process of the consumer, whoever they may be. You know, what, I, what resonates with me is that so many of our listeners are looking at the next chapter in their life and or starting now to prepare for that next chapter down the road in terms of what kind of legacy can they leave and what would they like it to look like. And so you're putting the two together, JC, in terms of psychology with the digital marketing makes a huge amount of of sense to me because 
today more and more as you're going to look at what's that legacy if you really want to leave a legacy we're going to now need to look past just ourselves and our family and a few things that we can touch there's a element of a digital that's going to be a part of everything and it's a matter of knowing how to pull this together so having somebody like you who understands the digital component and the psychology component what a man's basic needs becomes huge huge so tell me uh, go ahead oh no i was saying i i i agree absolutely so tell me as you've worked with people Give us an example of uh, doing a lead gen for a company that worked really beautifully for you. And just as an example for what people can anticipate in terms of what the process is with you and um, what it is that you do. Um, yeah, I, I, I can give you a couple examples. Um, so being more narrow focused, again, I, we have so many services, but to be more focused specifically on the B2B uh, lead gen side, I'll, I'll give you two examples of that. So one is, um, and I won't name the companies. We have, we have pretty strict NDAs apparently with our <laughs> companies we work with, especially in the tech industry. But um, <clears throat> uh, there was a, a larger uh, tech company um, that dealt more in the kind of Microsoft Dynamics implementation, right? They're more IT services style. And so, you know, they sell big, big deals. I mean, these aren't small things, you know, they weren't selling toothpicks. They were selling, you know, hundred thousand or million dollar deals or multi-million dollar deals with these right. companies. So the lead gen process obviously takes a longer amount of time typically with them. <clears throat> but when, what we did, we, we integrated a, a LinkedIn system um, as we had talked about before, where basically we, it's half, it was half automation and half manual where essentially, you know, we, we help them pick their, their laser target audience. We go through the messaging and get that pre-approved. Um, and then we would, you know, send out the invites and start doing that direct one-on-one, -on -one, but on scale. Right. So we could do it for, you know, multiple salespeople. Basically we integrated this with their sales staff. And so each sales staff had their own profile and their own campaign that targeted their own specific, you know, niche and industry they were going after. Um, long story short is, you know, when you, when you automate something like that or you scale it basically, and then you take that time off of the, uh, the salesperson's hands, you know, the results are, are pretty big because you got to think of an average salesperson doing it on their own you know, hunting on their own might get, you know, a couple of these big deals a year. Whereas when, as long as that salesperson still converts and closes at the same rate, if you increase the volume on the front half, just like we talked about those email subject lines, right? If everything else stays the same, but you change one thing that affects the rest in the chain, right? however much you change it affects that proportionally. Right. So, you know, now you've got salespeople doing four or five multi-million dollar deals a year that we're doing maybe one to two just because we can scale the beginning part of that while keeping the integrity of the targeting down, you know, and our system has, um, you know, drip series campaigns within LinkedIn. It also transfers information of the pro of the, uh, of the prospect into their CRM. And, you know, some of these bigger companies have already systems that they have right. built in place that when someone gets in their CRM, what they do. So that really helped feed that other funnel, um, for like their newsletters, for their cold calling, you know, whatever. Um, and then we also had a, an email drip series campaign that, that funnels off of that as well in a one-to-one. -one. <clears throat> but now that being said, that could be a lot of noise for a salesperson because when you increase the volume, you also increase the time that typically you have to attend to it. So what we did is we integrated a, um, <clears throat> more of a manual process where we respond for them. We create a, a reply scenario document where essentially what happens is, um, if you know 95% of all replies kind of fall under one of three categories, right? It's either going to be, um, you know, not interested, um, interested, um, or uh, a dead end message. What I call, right. you know, uh, yeah. So, so the, the the dead end. I'm sorry. The dead end messages <clears throat> are more of like you know, thanks or uh, thumbs up. You know, something <laughs> like that, right? So we come up with scenarios that say, okay, well, what do we do in that case, right? You know, what do we? Uh, you know, what do we say to that? And when we get that, yeah, we get that approved by the salesperson. So really what happens is that the salesperson knows that it, that we're completely taking care of the entire process. I make a joke where, you know, they say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, marketing is leading the horse to water and sales is making it 
drink, right? Like, you know, so we can't make a drink because we don't sell, but the salesperson can. But we are not interested in MQLs. We're not interested in marketing qualified leads. A marketing qualified lead would be someone replying even with, you know, with even just, you know, uh, with just in general, right? Because they're targeted and whatnot. And then that means that you can start marketing more to them. A sales qualified lead is someone who's express, who is targeted, that they already know what you're selling and they've expressed interest and they want to learn more. That's a sales qualified lead. And so I always joke and I say, we will take the horse to water. We will put its head to the water. We will touch its lips to the water. <laughs> and all you have to do <laughs> is make it take a drink. Like that's, we take it so far so that the salesperson just only has to deal with the people who are targeted, have already got the messaging about what it is. They know exactly what you do, what, how it benefits them. And, and they want to either, they want to, they have, you know, buying questions like how much is it, you know, uh, you know, service product offerings, contract terms, you know, things like that, or they want to get jump on a call or, or they want you to send them more information because they are interested. So that's what we do. Um, that that's one of the big, uh, things that, that we offer. It's a very done for you service. And we focus very heavily on the LinkedIn ecosphere, uh, to do that for the B2B. The other, we were, I mean, you were talking about this randomly is actually the, the podcast host. We actually, we completely like tripped and stumbled into this demographic. We don't even advertise this on our website because it's so completely left field from what we, the, the demographic we go after, but we accidentally end up really helping um, this one podcast uh, uh, owner <clears throat> uh, get really big guests on their show. And then, and, and then they are also able to sell them their services afterward. And it worked so well that we got them booked out like literally over a year to where they just had to tell us to stop because he's like, what do I tell people now? It's like, okay, we're going to record this podcast and it'll launch next year. Like, so like we, we kind of did too well in a way, <clears throat> um, but that was really random too. So, but that was also done through LinkedIn. Cause again, any kind of B2B outreach that you can think of um, if you have the right strategies and, and processes in place, uh, you can scale a phenomenal amount of, of warm qualified leads uh, from that process. Wow. JC, there is so much to learn and we have talked for a long time here. It's been wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, those of you who are listening, uh, if you would like to get in contact with JC, would like further information, just let us know. We will be glad to connect you with JC. He certainly is doing a tremendous amount in this arena of lead gen and digital marketing. And it is our lifeblood. So you are welcome to connect with me and we will be glad to get that information to you. JC, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for being with Building My Legacy podcast today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell button above. Leave comments. We'd love to hear what you think. And visit our other social media links as well. Thanks much.